Nobody wants to help me, and I'm dying. You're not dying, Mom. I got the results of the test back. I definitely have breast cancer. Is the existential fear of our own mortality a healthy thing or a harmful thing? The world media has recently been abuzz with talk of the outbreak of the coronavirus, which has been rampaging across China and the rest of the world, causing considerable alarm and fear internationally as the virus continues to spread. With so much media coverage, many people have become, understandably, concerned for their own health. But oftentimes, that same fear can produce panic, and panic can produce irrational behaviors which frequently results in greater harm to the public health than it does good, such as widespread shortage of face masks as a result of hoarding, particularly when information is scarce or inaccurate. For example, said masks likely doing very little to prevent the spread of the disease. Try the mask! She'll be all over you like a hot pocket! What does she mean by this? Fear regarding the virus has produced all kinds of potentially dangerous behavior as well, including people attempting to travel and flee infected areas, while at the same time, plenty have turned the event into, well, a bit of a meme, viewing much of it as a joke and emphasizing that the disease has so far, for example, mostly only been fatal to the elderly or infirm, or inventing, you know, Corona-chan. Despite the memeing, though, the disease is one to be concerned about, with the mortality rate reported as high as potentially 3% according to a preliminary report in The Lancet, compared to the flu, at least in the United States, which as of current CDC data has a mortality rate of only 0.05%. That means coronavirus is potentially up to 60 times more deadly than the flu, and yet many outlets insist that the virus is negligible, while others contend that the end is indeed nigh. And all of these messages change and evolve seemingly at a far faster rate than the flu itself possibly could, with theories regarding its origin and rumors regarding the state of its spread reporting both massive numbers of infected people and also extremely minor ones. Why is there such a seeming disparity in this reaction to the appearance of the disease, and why do so many of us react in such a seemingly dissimilar way out of fears of death and illness? Some react with panic and some with mockery. In order to understand this paradox, let's look at research on mortality salience and terror management that make what's a meme to some a terrifying mortal threat to others. <laughs> I'm in danger! Largely based on media exposure and dissemination of information, as well as, as we'll come to see, a whole bunch of personal variables. But before we get into this incredibly uplifting topic, let me tell you about something I'm actually excited to share with you guys. And that's this video sponsor, Coursera. Why am I happy to tell you about Coursera? Well, because it's the exact kind of service I support. One that promotes autodidacism and self-learning specifically. Learning on your own terms outside of the costly classroom. Coursera was founded by two Stanford computer scientists and offers specializations, certificates, and full bachelor's or even master's degrees from leading universities and companies, including Yale, University of Pennsylvania, Google, and IBM, just to name a few. The best thing about Coursera is that if you don't want to pay for a certificate or specialization, backed by these legitimate academic institutions and businesses, which you can add to your resume or CV, you can instead just audit countless courses absolutely free. Because that's exactly what I think education should be, free. For example, you're here on this channel, so you might have some interest in psychology, I would just wager a guess. But unfortunately, unlike Yale, I can't offer you a certificate for watching my videos. Although given their length, you certainly deserve an award for making it through them. Through Coursera, you can take an introduction to psychology course taught by a Yale professor, 100% online, and with flexible deadlines to learn at your own pace. If you want a certificate from Yale for your completion of the course, you can pay for that and financial aid is available. Or you can, again, just audit it absolutely free. If you're thinking about going back to school, not only is financial aid available and their prices are a lot cheaper than most traditional degrees, but many of their programs allow you to transfer credits so you don't waste your time and money. And if you are unhappy, they do have a refund policy. If it sounds like something you'd be interested in, and I think it might be for a lot of you dear friends, click the link in my description and consider signing up for Coursera. For me, this sponsorship is a win-win because even if not a single one of you is interested in their services for certification or degrees, any learning tool is usually a pretty good thing. 
Most importantly, like I said, it's free to sign up and you'll have access to courses on just about every topic under the sun, from coding to postmodernism, or just more psychology, if you can't get enough of it here, which is a bit of a terrifying idea that you would want to learn more about psychology after watching the rest of this giant data dump. And speaking of terror, let's talk about terror management and the psychology of fear. Terror management theory, or TMT, not to be confused with the radioactive terrapins of the somewhat same acronym, posits simply that we all know we are mortal and will eventually die, and that knowledge, when contemplated, generates a feeling of existential terror, which we are psychologically driven to ameliorate. The majority of research on TMT provides participants with some sort of prompt that in some way encourages them to think about death or mortality, evoking mortality salience. And research has shown consistently that people really don't like to think about their own mortality, as you might expect. This has been illustrated in research spanning over three decades of work, but let's start by looking at Greenberg et al. 2000, who asked people to complete a word search puzzle for a number of death-related words, and then asked them questions about their own fears about their personal demise before providing them with information that indicated people who felt more emotional were more likely to die young, and asked them about their own personal emotionality concerning this information. People who completed the personal questions about their own death, the proximal mortality salience prompt, were much less likely to report themselves as experiencing emotions strong emotions that they were told may be unhealthy when the questions about mortality were given immediately before describing their emotions. Additionally, all people who were given prompts about their mortality, except those who were just given the word puzzle directly beforehand, expressed greater degrees of nationalism. Both findings indicate that exposure to mortality salience causes us to react defensively, either by deferring to a belief in, let's say, the strength of our nation, or in our own personal strength as an individual by denying our own susceptibility to death or disease. You never! Never defeat the human spirit! You'll never defeat God! You'll never win! In order to reduce the terror that we feel when our mortality is salient, rather than accepting our own vulnerability, we are often likely to deny it, and instead attempt to bolster our belief that it is impossible for us to be susceptible to these kinds of harmful effects, to fall back on our possible defenses, be they personal or cultural. Mortality salience can have other potentially negative effects on our mental state and behavior than just encouraging feelings of invulnerability or increased in-group preference. It may also cause us to be less utilitarian. Chamolier, Denise, and Bonfon, 2012, asked French participants to think about death and then gave them a vignette that either involved conflict or no conflict. An example of a conflict scenario asked participants if a civilian father should smother his crying infant child to avoid detection from enemy soldiers in order to save his other five children, risking the health and safety of the infant, while in the non-conflict condition, the father could simply give the baby a pacifier. Those primed with thoughts of death were much less likely to choose the utilitarian option for the conflict story, suggesting, for instance, that the father instead allow himself and all of his children to potentially be captured. In a second study, before reading the story but after reading the death prime, which is not a giant robot, it just means an exposure to information about death. Sorry, I do not speak communist. Participants were asked to perform a cognitive memorization task of varying degrees of complexity. While again, mortality salience produced lower utilitarian responses, those who completed the very complex tasks with the most cognitive load were the least likely to choose the utilitarian option. While utilitarian choices were the lowest for both the mortality salience conditions and the control condition when cognitive load was highest, it was particularly strong on deterring utilitarianism in those that were thinking about death. Similar effects of mortality salience on cognition were illustrated by Blankenbuehler, 2012, who found that people who thought about their own death performed less competently on a general mental abilities test than those not given the death prime, particularly when they had a high intrinsic fear of death. Interestingly, though, mortality salience had no effect on working memory, and the participants who performed more poorly on a test of memory were those who had a high inherent fear of death and dying, but had not been given the death thought prompt. In other words, thinking about death doesn't affect our memory, but it can affect our intelligence. On the one hand, gold. On the other hand, painful, agonizing failure. 
In terms of the emotional and psychological effects of mortality salience, while the majority of research concerning it has found that thinking about death does not produce generally negative feelings, Lambert et al. 2014 contended that their relationship was not so simple. They found that fears played an important role in negative emotions associated with death thoughts, including anxiety, sadness, and anger. As one might expect, mortality salience was related to greater feelings of being afraid, scared, frightened, nervous, jittery, or shaky. The researchers found that mortality salience alone does not produce negative emotions, but only when it also produces feelings of fear or anxiety does it produce negative affect. Further, fear elicited by mortality salience was negatively related to explicit self-esteem. In and of itself, self-esteem has been shown to strongly be related to the effects of mortality salience, as, for example, Rutledge et al. 2010 found across a series of studies that thinking about death was negatively related to life satisfaction, subjective vitality, which is a measure of feeling alive and eudaimonic, and well-being, but only for those who had a low baseline of self-esteem, which is interesting when you combine it with the previously mentioned data that indicated that when we're afraid, mortality salience can lower our self-esteem. When participants' self-esteem was threatened by being asked to think about their personal failures and were then given time to ruminate on these thoughts before having their mortality made more salient, they expressed significantly lower senses of meaning in their own lives than others who were just given the death prompt immediately following the self-esteem threat or those whose self-esteem was bolstered. And in general, those with lower self-esteem experienced the lowest sense of meaning when the accessibility of death thoughts was high. In direct contrast, those with existing high self-esteem actually experienced greater feelings of life satisfaction, vitality, and life meaning when they were exposed to mortality salience, or at least were generally unaffected by the prime. Similarly, those with low self-esteem tended to avoid social situations and tended to be higher in anxiety when exposed to thoughts of death, while those higher in self-esteem didn't have these issues. Interestingly, and related to some of the risk-taking behaviors and sense of a vulnerability that we've already looked at, while those with low self-esteem who were prompted to consider death tended to avoid new ideas and theories, those with high self-esteem who were thinking about their potential end were actually more open to exploring novel concepts. Perhaps precisely because thinking about death can cause us to bolster our own sense of immortality and even be prone to take risky actions, mortality salience has been found to have no negative effect on our physiology, including heart rate, electrodermal activity, and respiration, as found by Clackle and Jonas 2019. That is, while thinking about death may affect us mentally and potentially emotionally, it has very little effect on our actual physical well-being, and in many cases may make us feel better psychologically based on our individual differences, particularly in self-esteem. Is crabs more embarrassing than AIDS? Oh. For the moment, probably. A series of studies from Nimich et al. 2010 further studied mortality salience in relationship to another potentially important trait, mindfulness. A mindful person is one who finds him or herself preoccupied with the future or the past, while a person low in mindfulness often does things without paying much attention to them. In the first study, participants were given prompts to consider their own deaths, included in a series of personality questions, and then asked about their support for the United States. They found that people who were given the mortality prompts were much more prone to believe that 1776 will commence again when they were lower in trait mindfulness. In addition to increased nationalism, people for whom mortality was more salient were also more likely to experience other forms of in-group preference, as a second study illustrated that white people asked to think about death and then determine the guilt of a defendant accused of racial discrimination, when they were low in mindfulness, were very unlikely to assign much guilt to a white defendant. Those high in mindfulness, however, assigned the most guilt to the white defendant, and generally, regardless of mortality salience, guilt assigned to the black defendant was non-significantly distinct. Those low in mindfulness and exposed to thoughts of death were also much less forgiving of social transgressions, as a third study asked participants to determine how harsh of a punishment should be given to someone who committed some act of significant wrongdoing. For example, a doctor who mixes up patient files and accidentally amputates the leg of a person who was scheduled for a simple knee surgery. Yeah, that's a bit of a big oof, bit of a major transgression there. Those low in mindfulness who were exposed to the mortality prompt were less forgiving 
and an additional study found that this group, those low in mindfulness, were just lower in the tendency for forgiveness in general. While those who are thinking about death and are also low in mindfulness may be more harsh in judging others and possess greater in-group bias, going back to the findings of Greenberg, this doesn't mean that they are more concerned with their own personal well-being, at least when we again throw self-esteem into the mix as it potentially creates a sense of invulnerability as a coping mechanism for the existential terror of the fear of death. An additional study from Nimitz et al. found that those with high body-related self-esteem who considered their mortality were really down to clown and engage in some sexual activity for the purpose of pleasure without having a relationship with their sexual partner. In other words, some risky, dirty business. Well, of course I love him, Barbara. Then just give him what he wants. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Put out, honey! In contrast, those low in self-esteem and mindfulness were very uninterested in casual, potentially dangerous sexual encounters. Taken together, what all of this means is that not everyone is affected by mortality salience the same way, and that traits, particularly mindfulness and self-esteem, can provide a bit of a defense against some of the more irrational outcomes that terror management can produce, but can also produce some of them themselves, including risk-taking behaviors. Because mindfulness can be a state or a trait, this means that some of us will be more mindful at some times more than others, but some of us are simply more prone to being mindful all of the time, this doesn't affect everyone equally. Nimitz and colleagues found no relationship between mindfulness and gender, meaning both men and women are as likely to possess it as a trait. However, they did find that mindfulness was related to several other personality traits, including self-esteem and the Big Five. Specifically, trait mindfulness was positively slightly related to extroversion, but moderately positively related to both agreeableness and conscientiousness, while it was moderately negatively related to neuroticism. Another trait that may affect how influential mortality salience impacts individuals, similarly to mindfulness, is virtue. As Ferraro, Shiv, and Bettman 2005 found, those exposed to thoughts of death who reported themselves as being highly ethical donated the most to charity, while those who did not consider themselves to be virtuous donated the least compared to the control group. So knowing all of these things about how traits differ, we have to kind of consider the cultural differences between people in the East and West when we're talking about something like the coronavirus, which overwhelmingly, at least currently, is affecting Eastern nations. So let's look at cultural differences in terror management and how it might be influenced by some of these traits we've just talked about. The potential importance of all of those trait associations in the context of the current fear regarding the coronavirus is that research has consistently found general cultural differences in Big Five personality traits and self-esteem, which as we've seen are related to how people react to thoughts of death between different cultures. For example, Schmidt et al. 2007 reported compared to all other countries, East Asian cultures are less extroverted as well as much less agreeable and conscientious than North American culture and slightly less agreeable and conscientious than most European cultures. Additionally, East Asian cultures are generally higher in neuroticism than any other culture. Similarly, Schmidt and Alec 2005 found that East Asian nations tend to have lower reports of self-esteem, including self-confidence and self-liking than Western nations, with, for example, the mean self-confidence of Hong Kong citizens being nearly three points lower than US citizens and nearly two points lower in self-liking. In terms of total self-esteem, Hong Kongers ranked a full 4.7 points lower than US Americans in the instrument. This doesn't mean that East Asian people are less mindful because they have lower self-esteem or because they differ in these traits on average, and that therefore they don't have the same potential defenses against terror management. For instance, Rafi Fathana, Jose, and Chab Thamkit, I'm sure I pronounced all of that wrong, 2018, found no average difference in mindfulness between Thai and New Zealand college students, but rather that mindfulness may be somewhat different in different cultures, as the Chinese version of the mindfulness instrument developed by Deng et al. 2011 did find. While the Chinese edition mostly aligned with the English one, a major difference appeared in the individual mindfulness facet of observation, which reflected existing research from the United States that illustrated that while being highly observative can be related to greater anxiety in people who are unfamiliar with meditation, in those who practice meditation, observation was related to a positive emotional state rather than a negative one. And given the commonality of meditation as a regular practice in Buddhism in China, mindfulness may not exactly be the same thing across all cultures. Another study from Arthur et al. 2017, studying nursing students from China, the Philippines, and South Africa, further illustrated this difference, 
As well, again, there was no difference in mean propensity towards mindfulness as a trait across cultures. Individual factors were different. Chinese nursing students were much better at describing their feelings than students from the other two nations, for example. Compared to other samples from Italy, Chinese meditators, and the general Chinese population, interestingly, the general Chinese community was the lowest in total scores on mindfulness. But in terms of facet score means, the general Chinese population was quite similar to the general United States population when it came to mindfulness. So while Chinese meditators and Chinese nurses might be higher in mindfulness, the average Chinese citizen is about as mindful as the average United States citizen although the distinct facets of mindfulness are not identical across the two populations. This may indicate that Asian cultures, including the average Chinese citizen, may respond to mortality salience differently than Westerners, and this difference was examined by Ma Callums and Blaskovich, 2012. Wait, wait a minute, Bla Blaskovich? Well, he's one of the pioneering scholars of virtual reality and human communication, and co-authored one of my favorite, although now dated, books. Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent, it's just kind of weird to see you here, doctor, but a pleasant surprise. Anywho, my minor academic fangirling aside, the researchers primed Americans of European descent and first or second generation East Asian participants with a prompt to think about their inevitable demise, and were then asked to complete a word puzzle task by filling in the blanks and completing a word. For example, complete the following word beginning with C-O-F-F. -F. Those thinking more about death might think of the word coffin, while those thinking less about death might instead think of the word coffee. I don't like some more coffee. What country are you from? They found that participants of East Asian backgrounds were more likely to complete the words not related to death after their mortality was made salient. When asked what kind of activity they would like to engage in after thinking about death, East Asians were far more likely to choose to do daily normal activities, like reading a book, rather than activities that might have some larger long-term effect on society, such as participating in a jury or a college debate. Finally, East Asians found both jokes and comics much more funny than European Americans did when their mortality was salient. Looking specifically at Chinese populations, Wang, Zhu, and Luo, 2016, studied how mindfulness directly and indirectly affected behavior and found that mindfulness was related positively to the ability to generate positive emotions and recover from negative emotions more easily both of which were negatively related to mood disturbance, which itself is positively related to a plethora of negative emotional states, including anxiety, depression, hostility, fatigue, and confusion. Mindfulness was also directly negatively related to mood disturbance and positively directly related to vigor activity, which is essentially one's tendency to engage in active normal behaviors. In other words, what all of this means is that Chinese and other East Asian people who are mindful, and we know they're about as likely to be mindful as any other cultural group, are more likely to be active and outgoing rather than be afraid when faced with mortality salience or other sources of emotional distress. What that all indicates is that in the face of death, those of an East Asian cultural background may be more likely to simply go about their day as usual and look on the bright side of things than those of a European cultural background. Life's a piece of shit when you look at it. While this may be helpful when it comes to maintaining civility and avoiding panic, in the face of an epidemic like the coronavirus, maintaining normal behavior can exacerbate the spread of the disease, which can mean that this does more harm than good in some instances. It's important to note, however, when talking about cultural differences, that Rutledge 2010, who conducted that big series of tests assessing the relationship between mortality, salience, self-esteem, and the psychological effects of it, replicated some of their research in a sample of Chinese exchange students and found nearly identical results concerning self-esteem and meaning-making. That is, Chinese students with low self-esteem who were exposed to thoughts of death reporting lower feelings of a sense of meaning in their life, believing their lives have purpose. Those Chinese exchange students with high self-esteem who thought about death were, in contrast, higher in their sense of meaning than the control sample. Again, when we consider terror management, this makes sense as for some people, particularly those high in self-esteem and mindfulness, thinking about death can produce a sense of invulnerability and even possibly produce risk-taking behaviors. While Rutledge and colleagues only replicated this one study in a Chinese sample, it's not unreasonable to surmise that similar results would apply, for example, to their findings regarding propensity towards exploration of new concepts, which was most prevalent in those thinking about death who were also high in self-esteem. We don't really have enough 
information to say for sure, though, on the topic of exploration specifically, but what has been illustrated is that the typical effects, such as those identified by many terror management scholars, including Greenberg and Nimich, which indicate that mortality salience often produces in-group bias, was not present in a sample of Chinese female students as assessed by Feng et al., 2017. These researchers actually found the opposite trend in Chinese women that we often see in U.S.-based research on mortality salience, which, as we've seen, shows that when you remind people of their death, they often tend to be more nationalistic. Participants were scanned using fMRI to gain a baseline of their neural activity. They were then primed to think about death. After the prime, the women played a game supposedly against an opponent of either similar Chinese background or outgroup Korean background, and were given options to spend points earned in the game to punish the other player, reward the other player, or split their points evenly for the maximum benefit of both players. Of course, the other player did not actually exist, and was all for the purpose of the experiment. But given what we know about utilitarianism being negatively related to mortality salience and in-group bias being positively related in the same phenomenon, we would expect these women to have punished the Korean players and rewarded the Chinese ones. But that was not the case. Which is a bit difficult to believe if you've ever seen the average StarCraft II tournament, although we do know which side of the Isle Blizzard's on there. I am sorry, and I accept accountability. Is this uh, an out-of-season April Fool's joke? Participants were less likely to punish both the in-group and the out-group in the face of death thoughts and were similarly more giving to both the Chinese players and the Korean players when they were thinking about their own mortality. The effects of the death thought prime could also be seen in the subsequent fMRI scans, which showed a dampening effect of activity in areas of the brain associated with group membership, including the bilateral regions of the temporal parietal junction, the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex, the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and the left lateral orbital frontal cortex. Big words, you know. Given that Eastern cultures tend to react differently to mortality salience than as we've seen, this may again indicate a difference in propensity to be more peaceful and fairer and calm when faced with fears of death in the East than in the West. This difference in behavior can be both positive and negative, though, in that obviously it's a good thing for people to be more calm and relaxed and even caring in the midst of potentially deadly scenarios, while at the same time, a lack of self-concern or defensive action when that scenario is a highly contagious epidemic, well, that's probably not so positive for public health. While we've looked at the negative effects that mortality salience can produce, I've also hinted that there may be some benefits of it. So just what are the benefits of mortality salience and how can the existential fear of death make us feel better? Or if not, how can those effects be mitigated? Let's start by asking how exactly can we ameliorate the negative effects of terror management? And let's ask, is it always really necessary to do so? In addition to mindfulness and potential cultural norms producing different reactions in mortality salience primes, Greenberg et al. 2003 also illustrated that the fear experienced by thinking about death can be fairly easily ameliorated via psychosomatic methods. Participants were primed with either thinking about their own death or about dental pain, and were then given a placebo sugar pill, which the researcher reported was either an anti-anxiety pill or a memory-enhancing supplement. <laughs> and were then asked to evaluate two essays, one of which was pro-American and the other one anti-American, to assess support for nationalism, which we know increases often in those primed with their mortality, particularly when they're low in mindfulness or self-esteem. Those who believed they had taken the anti-anxiety medicine evaluated the two essays evenly compared to those who took the memory enhancer, who much preferred the pro-United States piece. So, while we can mitigate these effects even with a simple placebo pill, do we really need to, and when might we need to? Self-esteem, as has been illustrated, appears to often guard against some of the negative effects of mortality salience, but also, somewhat paradoxically, can cause us to act irrationally. But what self-esteem can also do when we are exposed to a death prime can have a positive effect on our mental state, as Blankenbuhler 2012 found in a second study, that people with high self-esteem performed more competently on a test of intelligence and had better working memory specifically when they were primed with mortality salience. In other words, people with high existing levels of self-esteem may actually benefit cognitively from thinking about their own inevitable demise in terms of their mental acuity. 
Я сей вам! Вот холд писта! Лайк ми! You shall never shoot the inaccurate! Because of fear of shooting fingers! Further, mortality salience may produce some positive health behaviors under specific circumstances. Taubman Benari and Findler 2005 asked Israeli participants of various ages to consider their eventual death and then asked them about their intentions to engage in healthy behaviors in the future, such as going to the dentist when they have a sensitive tooth or going to the doctor after being informed there was a problem in their recent blood tests. Younger adults, and to a stronger degree middle-aged adults, were more likely to promote healthy activities when their mortality was salient, but interestingly, Older adults exposed to thoughts of death were less likely than those not exposed in their same age bracket to promote those behaviors. In other words, older people, those actually more prone to potential health risks, were less likely to engage in healthy activity when they thought about death. These trends were influenced, however, by, surprise, surprise, the individual level of self-esteem, which we know plays a major role in the effects of mortality salience. For young adults, thinking about death produced a greater propensity towards positive health activities in those high in self-esteem, but a lower propensity in those lower in self-esteem compared to the control. For older adults, the opposite was the case, with low self-esteem producing more pro-health behavior than high self-esteem. However, in both conditions, being exposed to thoughts of the finite nature of humanity was related to decreased intentions to act in a healthy way in older adults, in contrast to those given another prime. Older drivers never lie. In fact, they brag. Oh, lot, mate. Maybe 200 bees. Once again, we can see that mortality salience often causes people to deny their own mortality. Much as self-esteem and mindfulness affect the degree to which we are affected by mortality salience and the behaviors we may be more or less likely to engage in when thinking about death, perhaps unsurprisingly, our favorite cuddle hormone, oxytocin, has been found to play a role in the process, as illustrated by Fundmeira, Schindler, and Bergstaller, 2019. The researchers asked German students questions related to death and then had them read two articles, one of which was pro-Germany and the other which expressed anti-German sentiments, both implied to have been written by foreign authors. Some participants were given a placebo and others were given a little snort of the old love bug and they found that elevated oxytocin levels were related to a more balanced view of the anti-German writer's intelligence, competence, truth, as well as more general agreement with their opinion. Overall, those given oxytocin were much more sympathetic to the anti-German writer than those in the placebo condition or those not prompted with mortality salience. Being close to others then, physically, may reduce some of the in-group bias that mortality salience often produces, although this is just one German sample and is probably not fully applicable to either a US or Chinese sample of population, as nationalistic feelings are quite different across different nations. Okay. As mentioned in the findings from Rutledge et al. 2010, those with high self-esteem exposed to thoughts of death may actually experience greater meaning in life, greater vitality, and greater satisfaction, suggesting that in some instances thinking about death may make us happier with our lives. After all, the basic premise regarding the negative ways we sometimes respond to thoughts of the existential fear of death indicates that those who are more satisfied with their existing lives may be unworried by those fears. And a similar study from Rutledge and Jewell 2010 indicates just that. They found that participants who had a higher baseline perception of meaningfulness in their lives experienced anxiety regarding feelings of death that were similar to those whose mortality was not made salient in the control condition. That is, people who believe their lives had inherent purpose are pretty much immune to some of the fears that mortality salience often produces. Another factor that may defend against some of the negative emotional outcomes of terror management is creative achievement, which, much like finding meaning in one's life, seemingly serves as a parapet in those who believe they would succeed in achieving creative goals, as seen in data from Pierarch and Wiseman 2016, who found that those high in creative achievement, who also set high creative goals for themselves, were actually lower in death thought accessibility after being prompted with thoughts of mortality than those not given the mortality prime. Once again, this seeming paradox illustrates that people who have a lot to live for may actually be unconcerned with death, particularly when they are encouraged to think about fatal outcomes. This can be both a benefit and a potential danger, as it may have the capacity to cause some people, those more resilient to mortality salience, to behave in ways that do not protect their own well-being 
due to this lack of fear. One potential outcome of this fearlessness may be a tendency to downplay thoughts of death with humor. Long and Greenwood, 2013, for example, found that participants who were given a subliminal death prime, wherein they were shown a series of words flashing quickly across a screen that contained terms related to death or dying, and were then asked to write humorous captions for a comic, produced captions that were viewed by external raters as funnier than those who were not given the death prime. However, those who received an explicit death reminder, being asked to think carefully about their feelings about dying, were rated as less funny than those who were asked to think about just physical pain. Yet while thinking about death in those who have high self-esteem, are more mindful and are more goal-oriented and more satisfied with life, could lead to more flippant disregard for safety or minimalizing of potential harm, it actually may also make us physically stronger, as seen in a study from Peters et al. 2005, who measured the grip strength of participants before and after evoking thoughts of death with a prompt. <laughs> For participants who were not invested in lifting weights, their grip strength was unchanged before and after thinking about mortality, compared to the low investment control group which had a slightly stronger grip in the second measurement. In contrast, for those who did work out frequently, mortality salience produced a significant increase in strength compared to the control. Finally, on the more positive side of things as well, thinking about death may make us more grateful for the lives that we do have. As Frias et al. 2011 found that compared to participants who were asked to think about a typical day, those who thought about death, and particularly those who were asked to reflect about the visceral elements of death, such as the feelings, sights, and sounds one might experience while being trapped in a burning building, were significantly more gratuitous regarding their own lives. Although the researchers also found that while gratitude increased, positive affect, positive feelings, did not. What all of this means, in short, for this long video, is that thinking about death affects all of us a bit differently, based on a whole number of variables, and while it can improve our mental state in some instances, it can also create depression, isolation, and anxiety in others. All that we've spoken about here today, though, just comprises a fraction of the findings related to terror management and mortality salience, which tend to only be consistent in how inconsistently people are affected based on any number of individuating factors and variables and traits to mortality salience. Often, death thoughts make us minimize those fears, while in others they can consume us with fear and act in a way that is irrational or even dangerous. For the media that reports on news about things like outbreaks and epidemics then, as well as other concerns for public health, how should messages be structured as to not encourage unhealthy behavior when we know that reactions to fear of fatality are so often so unpredictable? Precisely why fear-related health campaigns have such an abysmal track record is not only because we don't like being told what to do, a process known as psychological reactance. You can't tell me what to do. I didn't tell you what to do. You're skipping a line, dude. But because primes of death, in many instances, make us feel invulnerable and may even make us more prone to pro-social attitudes and to take risky approaches towards situations based on our own individual differences. In many cases, thinking about death may make us feel better and more emboldened in our actions. As with many communication theories, terror management as it concerns health messages operates on a dual process model, central and peripheral route processing. When a health-related message is processed centrally, the receiver deeply considers the facts and the reality of the situation, while when processed peripherally, the message elicits fear and disassociation from that message, as well as potentially any of the effects of mortality salience that we've looked at today, be they positive or negative, based on who the receiver is. A meta-analysis of research on the type of processing one will tend to utilize when exposed to health messages from Dehoog, Strobe, and DeWitt, 2007, gives us a good idea of when messages will produce more heuristic processing and when they will produce more serious cognitive consideration based on the vulnerability of the individual and the severity of the threat. Across 105 studies and 17,919 participants, here's what the researchers found. Feeling more vulnerable to a health risk was related to increased intentions to change and subsequent actual change in behavior. In contrast, vulnerability was unrelated to attitudinal change toward a health issue, but severity was. For example, people who are smokers who see an anti-smoking ad may be more likely to consider changing their actions, but they're very unlikely to change their opinions about smoking. Instead, people exposed to information about health risks of secondhand smoke may be more negative towards their opinions on smoking than those who do engage in the behavior. How can you smoke in this day and age? Have you not seen that ad? Huh, where the little kid walks through grandpa? 
It's chilling! Feeling vulnerable also produced negative affect and feelings of fear, and feeling fear in turn was related to minimizing thoughts about the onus of that fright. In turn, severe messages did not produce any increase in consideration for the health message being disseminated, although vulnerability did. In terms of the type of media message used, severe messages, be they in written or image format, were about equally effective in changing attitudes and intention, all to a relatively small degree. However, severe written messages had no effect on behavioral change, while severe images did. Ultimately, neither severity nor vulnerability were particularly good at changing attitudes, and while vulnerability was better at changing intentions, severity was better at changing behaviors. Rather than scaring people with a severe message or emphasizing vulnerability, argument quality is the aspect of health messages that was found to be the most consistently persuasive at changing attitudes and providing response efficacy, that is, giving people a reasonable course of action to pursue. However, the quality of arguments sent and response efficacy given had no effect on actual behavioral alteration. To summarize, feeling vulnerable makes us more likely to intend to change our health behaviors and potentially change them, but it also scares us and causes us to avoid thinking about the behavior, ultimately being less effective at changing that behavior. In contrast, a severe threat more often causes us to make changes to our actions, however, health messages intended to affect that behavior are aided neither by being persuasive nor by providing reasonable avenues of action for the receiver. In other words, trying to convince people to change their actions regarding health by scaring them with fears of death is a bit of a crapshoot, to put it mildly. Caleb, stop! Stop, Caleb, I will shoot you, bro, are you okay? Caleb! Caleb! But let's take it out of the abstract meta-analysis and ground what all of this means in some individual studies. Let's look to Ferraro, Shiv, and Bettman, 2005, mostly because I like the title of the article, Let Us Eat, Drink, For Tomorrow We Shall Die, but also gives us a good example of how scaring people can actually make them act in opposition to the healthier choice. In their first experiment, participants were asked if they would like to eat delicious chocolate cake or fruit salad. Specifically for women, those low in body-related self-esteem, who were made to think about their own death, were far more likely to choose the chocolate cake option than any other condition, including both men and women with high or low self-esteem. Guilty pleasure. Oh. Chocolate souffle. Chocolate souffle. Ch Come on, that's a great one. I can't go with you, Tom. Interestingly, in a second study, when women were asked to think critically about their food choice before selecting, this trend leveled out, with those primed to think about death being more likely to choose the cake regardless of their own degree of body-related self-esteem. This is such a weird finding, but it goes back to a lot of what we keep seeing with mortality salience and self-esteem, in that sometimes people with high self-esteem are unaffected, and other times they tend to be more likely to engage in potentially unhealthy behavior, just based on a few minor adjustments in the procedure or the circumstance. And looking at how much these women thought about their own bodies might shed some light on this. When women weren't encouraged to carefully consider their food choice, those high in self-esteem were highly concerned with thoughts related to their bodies. However, when they were encouraged to think about the choice, body image thoughts were about equal across both groups, high and low in self-esteem, with the only difference being that those thinking about death were less prone to think about their bodies in general. What this illustrates, though, and what we get out of the meta-analysis, is that trying to promote a more cognitive route processing of health-related messages after you've tried to scare someone with thoughts of death doesn't really produce any changes in behavior. If anything, it often results in the opposite of the intended effect of the health message. Very similar results have been reported regarding anti-smoking advertisements, particularly when self-esteem was taken into consideration, as assessed across multiple studies. For example, Martins and Kamen's 2009 exposed smokers to an anti-smoking message that either emphasized the health effects of smoking or insisted that smoking was super uncool, a negative social effect. They found that smokers with high self-esteem only expressed a greater design to quit smoking short-term when exposed to the social alienation message. I used to smoke because it was cool, but this is so, so not cool. When hearing about the health effects actually made those low in self-esteem less likely to say that they would quit in the short term compared to low self-esteem smokers who saw no advertisement. In contrast, for both low and high self-esteem smokers, the social-oriented ad was much more effective at eliciting desires to quit smoking in the future than the health-oriented message. 
Interestingly, despite being often unlikely to change, smokers in general were not unaware of the dangers of their behavior and viewed the health effects of smoking as more severe than the control group of smokers when they had been primed with mortality salience. In addition to behavioral intention, another study from Hansen, Winsler, and Topolinsky, 2010, similarly found that anti-smoking messages had a distinct effect on attitudes towards the behavior. Anti-smoking messages that emphasize controlling or regulating the behavior produce the most negative attitudes towards smoking in those highest in self-esteem, while in contrast, those low in self-esteem were most positive toward the action in response to the control-based message. In complete opposition, messages that emphasized the mortality of smoking produced decreased attitudes in those low in self-esteem, but resulted in the most positive attitudes towards smoking in those high in self-esteem. That is, people know that what they are doing is often unhealthy, but messages designed to convince them to change, particularly when those messages make one consider their potential death as a result of action or inaction, are unlikely to be effective and may instead even encourage the behavior or other risky activities. While it often depends on the individual, health-related issues and its relationship with self-esteem or other influential variables such as mindfulness, oftentimes prompting people with higher self-esteem with messages about their potential health risks of their behaviors only cause them to feel more positively about that behavior and become more adamant about the continuation of the activity. Most of what we've looked at in this segment involves behavioral intentions and attitudes, but actual behavioral change is typically, at best, unaffected, as we saw from the meta-analysis and the cake-eating study, usually only when the outcome is very severe. For example, Jessup and Wade, 2008, examined the effects of mortality salience and terror management in British binge drinkers and found that not only did just mentioning the concept of binge drinking serve as a prime of mortality salience, therefore producing all of the potential effects we know it can elicit, but actually may have encouraged binge drinking. Doug's dad was way too sober. He stuttered a lot. He seemed unaware of his direction. He didn't act like he wanted to do this shit for a living anymore. Loop him up with some false enthusiasm or give me my money back. For existing binge drinkers, when that behavior was related to their sense of self-esteem as a method of aiding in their socialization skills, there was no change in the behavior a week after being given the negative information about the health effects of binge drinking. However, this study also indicated that there was an increase in binge drinking behavior in those who previously did not binge drink when they were exposed to mortality salient messages about binge drinking, and as a result, came to find the behavior to be more socially acceptable or cool. I know many of you probably know this, but as always, we have to show it with data. People don't like being told what to do, and often they will react in the complete opposite way in reactance to the behavior that is being encouraged. In relation to the current concern regarding the coronavirus, the media hysteria surrounding the disease is unlikely to promote healthy behavior in people who may actually be susceptible to contracting it. For many people, particularly those higher in self-esteem and lower in mindfulness, they may instead engage in more risky activity and throw caution to the wind in response to pleas from public officials. To the contrary, feeling a sense of invulnerability and reacting to the threat of existential terror with confidence and dismissal. For this reason, the sensationalist headlines are likely to only do more damage than good, particularly when they evoke emotional, mortality-based responses that emphasize vulnerability over severity. Yet at the same time, there isn't consistent evidence that fact-based reporting is necessarily always better when the goal is attempts at persuasion for behavioral change. Terror management and mortality salience are phenomena that are not only highly individualistic, based on mediator variables, but also on cultural differences and the types of messages through which information is conveyed, be they informative or persuasive. Basically, the entire thing is a crapshoot, like I said, and I'm not sure I can tell you which way the wind is blowing to avoid getting a face full of it. So with that in mind, let's look at the effects of mortality salience and terror management in regard to epidemics. Looking just at media messages and epidemics, Clem Hartman and Das, 2019, looked at how language could potentially impact the way that people perceived a health risk when it was reported on by the media. To do this, they gave Dutch participants several different versions of a news article reporting on an outbreak of the enterovirus, with different variations manipulating reports of the disease's severity, from unusually dangerous to of low concern, the vulnerability of the reader to contract the disease being described as either in a distant locale or as an easily transmissible disease, which spreads like the flu. This is serious! Everybody, 
And finally, the orientation of the message as either emotional or factual by including a photo of a patient being transported to a hospital in the emotional condition or a photo of a politician or World Health Organization official in the factual condition. Those who read the more severe article experienced more negative affect, that is, they were more upset by the news report, but they also viewed themselves as more at risk to infection and subsequently reported greater intent to reduce engaging in potentially risky behaviors that might expose them to the disease. Participants who read the high vulnerability version of the report felt, well, expectedly more vulnerable, and as with the high severity condition, experienced increased negative affect and a desire to engage in risk avoidance. This all makes sense, right? But what about the emotion-laden news reports? Contrary to the researchers' expectations, showing images of people being hospitalized or ill did not increase perception of the disease's severity or their personal vulnerability, their negative feelings in regards to the article, nor their intentions to engage in healthy behaviors. Instead, the emotional images produced feelings of sensationalism, which instead reduced responsive behaviors in participants to the report. That is, People who felt that the news media was attempting to manipulate their feelings were more likely to dismiss the reports as exaggerated or fake news. This makes sense based on much of the research provided to us from terror management theory and mortality salience. We need not be restricted to the sterile social science laboratory to understand how the use of fear and mortality salience by media outlets affects people's feelings and behavior during a potential epidemic, as fortunately or unfortunately, we have a plethora of real-world examples. While an excess of sensational information can cause people to disregard the threat of a potential disease, a lack of information can also pose a major threat to public health. For example, Bolly Stewart and Pate 2016 examined the effect of the Ebola outbreak which began in West Africa in 2013, specifically in the country of Nigeria, wherein the epidemic was quickly controlled but, due to the nation's unfamiliarity with the disease, led to numerous negative social and economic outcomes. Nigerian citizens from Lagos, assessed in this study, most prominently gained their information about the novel disease from social media, followed by television and then communication with friends, much of which was sensational and factually incorrect. Illustrative of the extent of this misinformation, over 60% of Lagosian people erroneously believed that Ebola could be spread via touch, while another 20% believed that it could be spread via the consumption of pork or that it was transmissible via air. Many people altered their behavior in ways that did little to nothing to reduce their susceptibility of contracting or spreading the disease and may instead have been deleterious to their health and financial stability. As for instance, 43% of respondents said they avoided going to the doctor to avoid potential exposure, while many others avoided going out in public at all. This meant that several of those who fell ill with the disorder stayed at home rather than seeking treatment and it had long-lasting effects on some hospitals. The hospital that saw the first incidence of Ebola saw a 90% decrease in patients after being declared Ebola-free and a year later, only 20% of patients returned to the facility. Another result of this change in behavior in a country where the outbreak was, again, relatively quickly contained, was economic, as 29% of people experienced an increase in the cost of food, while simultaneously 28% saw a loss of wages from missing work and 16% reported actually losing their jobs. Instead, the hysteria resulted in a rush on sanitization products, while other goods and services saw massive profit losses. Taking into consideration everything we've learned about how scaring people with the potential deadliness of a disease, as the Ebola case illustrates, ultimately, people are more prone to spread disinformation and social information than they are health or preventative information, likely because people want to avoid the truly scary news and instead, as a product of terror management, bolster their self-esteem through social interaction. Oftentimes, both media and official health outlets do nothing to aid in this trend, as was the case in the 2009 H1N1 flu outbreak, as discussed by Ding and Zhang, 2010. They found that the CDC and DHHS most communicated information with the public via Facebook and Twitter, and that the majority of this information only concerned updates about the spread of the flu, with 68 posts being concerned with updates compared to only 26 posts regarding prevention and a mere 5 posts about scientific research. User-generated content similarly reflects this propensity, with Sina.com blogs being most concerned with witness reports comprising 148 posts compared to only 40 posts which contain information about prevention of influenza spread. Returning to the 2013-14 Ebola outbreak, global news coverage reflects this tendency to avoid factual data in favor of posting things that are more concerned with politics and or the suffering of individuals, which as we've seen only increases perceptions of sensationalism over rational health behaviors. 
Medical and scientific information tends to be much less common and relegated to more distal areas of social media posting compared to posts made about the social aspects of an outbreak, as we can see in these various analyses of postings from Roberts et al. 2017. Because information that causes us to think about death can have negative effects on our mental state, we seek to avoid it, and as a result, the information most shared tends to often be disinformation. What if she cuts herself? That will be an important lesson. Additionally, it's very easy for the sensationalism which causes these events to provoke terror management affected by media language. As found in an analysis of news reporting on the Ebola virus news coverage before and after a public statement was made about it by Barack Obama from Gesser Edelsberg et al. 2015. Before Obama's speech, 86.8% of news articles used the term outbreak, compared to only 8.6% that used the term epidemic. After Obama's speech, the media landscape changed significantly, with 53.8% of articles using the term outbreak and 53.3% using the term epidemic. Obviously, the term epidemic implies greater severity than outbreak does, and as such is more likely to evoke some of the related outcomes associated with mortality salience and sensationalism, in terms of news reporting on public health. That is, the more the media sensationalizes the spread of a disease, the more it may, in turn, actually cause people to downplay the potential dangers of said disease. In a roundabout way, the sensationalist things posted online regarding outbreaks may cause some to adopt a more positive attitude and go about their daily routines as if nothing is wrong. In other cases, it can cause people to spread rumors which can cause reactive behaviors that are also potentially harmful to public health. Attempts to scare people from the government or health organizations into changing their behavior to avoid infection may also produce the opposite of the intended effect and instead produce negative activities that are not only ineffective but may even increase the risk of spreading the disease. Moreover, in many other cultures and individuals, mortality salience can produce outgroup bias which similarly leads to irrational avoidance of others, as was the case in the SARS outbreak of the early 2000s, where in fear of having associated with Asian people or recent visitation to Asian countries caused some people to isolate themselves from access to public health services, as reported by Pearson et al. 2004. Similarly, Eichelberger 2007 conducted interviews with residents near New York City's Chinatown during the spread of SARS and found not only the kind of outgroup group distrust we know mortality salience can produce, but also irrational behavior, such as the mass purchasing of masks, often not even for personal use, but just for the purpose of saving and or hoarding. Additionally, the area experienced a severe decrease in revenue, likely out of fear and stigma regarding the disease. This is not me implying that people should avoid the Chinese who have recently traveled from the nation, or that fear of traveling to China is irrational, let alone racist, as some outlets have claimed but rather only that due to the effects of terror management, it may exacerbate intergroup hostility, which ultimately can culminate in intergroup conflict, which can do nothing but make the public health landscape worse. What is not irrational to point out is that many of the major disease outbreaks that have produced public concern over the last 20 years have originated in China, be it SARS or now the coronavirus, and a lot of the reason behind that likely lies in Chinese culture, from their eating habits to the close quarter conditions that many live in to the cultural differences in how Chinese people in general may tend to react towards mortality salience and threats of illness by not isolating themselves but instead maintaining normal activities and a positive outlook on life that is more more accepting of intergroup association, while for Westerners, quite the opposite is seemingly the norm. So what does all of this mean, both for the current health crisis surrounding the coronavirus and public health in general? Let's come to a few conclusions. As we've seen over the course of this video, how people react to fears of death or even just thoughts of death varies differently across individuals, cultures, and contexts. While some people may become anxious and disassociate, often to their own harm in response to these fears, others may instead become braver and disregard warnings of their own potential mortality in response, particularly to media messages that they find sensational, again, often to their own detriment. Given how easy it is for these things to become sensationalized, as seen in the case of one speech from Obama on Ebola illustrates, it takes very little for a localized flu to become an international panic. Of course, there are very rational reasons to be worried about the rapidly spreading disease that has been shown to have a death rate far above that of the typical flu, as well as to be more contagious. However, many times that fear produces behaviors that only exacerbate problems in two very distinct ways, either through feelings of invulnerability and amusement or through anxiety and panic. 
While certainly, the coronavirus is a very serious health hazard, either pattern of behavior that terror management can elicit carries its own serious risk. When people are afraid, they often do things like hoard face masks, which often may do little to prevent the spread of the disease, and also prevents others from accessing those items. Others may avoid trips to the hospital even when they do experience symptoms, fearing additional exposure, as seen in the Ebola outbreak. Either reaction can produce potentially negative public health outcomes, and hopefully, this video has helped to explain the psychological mechanisms behind these behaviors. But what do you guys think? How do you react to information about potentially dangerous conditions or scenarios? Do you tend to minimize the danger or to protect yourself? Perhaps neither of these describe your reaction to the coronavirus or other outbreaks or epidemics. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. As always, a massive thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon, Subscribestar, and Streamlabs. You guys are awesome and you really make producing this content possible. If you enjoyed this video, I would love for you to leave a like or a subscribe. And if you really liked it, links to ways to support the channel, as well as references to all of the studies cited are in the description as well. There's also my merch store if you want to buy something from there. And of course, a link to Coursera. I also want to give a massive shout out to Concordia Recordings for providing the background music to this video. Their stuff is awesome. There's a link in the description to their channel as well. Check them out. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, dear friends, all Tana Volt. You